So let, let's get started without further ado. This is what I wanted to cover this evening. Uh, some of the bits, those bits I've covered before, other bits will be new to you, but uh, that, that, that's the order of uh, the, the evening. And we start with the Devonshire Quarter. Now, I've spoken about the Devonshire Quarter many times. Uh, when I first spoke to you about the Devonshire Quarter, I showed you a lot of pictures about how bad it was and about the masonry that had fallen off the front of the Congress Theatre. And over the years, I've shown you updates uh, of the progress that's been made there. And uh, now, of course, we have the new Welcome Building and the, the, the Congress. Uh, last year, I showed you the internal uh, workings of the Congress and uh, some pictures of the Winter Garden and the splendid floor, floral hall that we've got there now. Uh, I'm not going to run through those slides again because I've shown you them before. So pretty well all of the work at the Welcome Building is finished, with the exception of the front of the Winter Garden. And so that's the only other slide that I'm going to show you on the Devonshire Park. Uh, currently, we know that that's the, the, the last piece of the jigsaw, so I very much want it completed. Uh, we've got an architect working on that at the moment, a name you may be familiar with, uh, Joe Sardi. Joe was responsible for uh, Moira House, and I, I think did some splendid work there. So someone we've got great faith in, and uh, busily crunching through the, the options for that and, and the, the, the financial figures for it. But that will be the uh, last part of that jigsaw. Um, so I, I put tennis courts, and, and that, that sort of flows from the, the, the Devonshire Quarter and the improvements we made. You may remember that going back a number of years, we were at risk of losing the uh, pre-Wimbledon event, and the Lawn Tennis Association weren't particularly happy with Eastbourne, and they were saying, well, we know we might, might not be back next year. That, that was back in, uh, I think it was 2007, 2008. Um, since then, we've made friends with them quite a bit. They're, they're much happier with us. They're very pleased with the new accommodation that the players have, the, the new building where they can have a chill-out zone and they've got their uh, changing area and their showers. And uh, so much so that when the tournament took place this year, um, one of the uh, Lawn Tennis uh, Association officials was speaking to me and was saying that they had a bit of money that they could use to improve tennis courts for the community and we spoke to them a bit more and I'm delighted to say that they've promised to uh, refurbish the tennis courts in, at Fisherman's Green along the seafront and the two tennis court or two of the tennis courts at Manor Gardens, not the ones that the club use which are, are, are brilliant, the ones that Francis and Gemma have got down at the bottom end of Gildridge Park but the ones higher up which are tucked away a bit at, at Manor Gardens so this coming spring, those will be refurbished, which I think is really good news. Um, on to sea defences. Um, last year, I shared with you <coughs> these slides. The Environment Agency, in partnership with the Council, are looking at £100 million. And the £100 million that I said last year, I think, is a, a gross underestimate. I think they'll probably be looking at something like 150 million pounds minimum in terms of dealing with the sea defences. Uh, I've been quite impressed with the fact uh, that they, they seriously seem to want to talk to local people. They've been down, they've conducted a number of uh, consultation events and uh, that's the area that we're looking at. So we're running right from Cooden Beach right the way down, down past Pevensey and along Eastbourne. Um, now uh, they, they've finished those, the, the, that round of consultations and they're crunching through the options. So uh, hopefully uh, by uh, the, your, your event next year, your meeting next year, um, there'll be an opportunity to update you on the proposals that they're coming forward with. These are not plans that they're going to do immediately, but they are vital to protecting the town because an awful lot of the properties in Eastbourne are at a, a, a flood risk. I mean, I live in a property. Uh, when uh, I bought it, nobody told me there was a flood risk in it, uh, attached to it. Uh, but when I went to get my insurance recently, they tell me that there is, and that's why the premium's gone up. Uh, I've never experienced any flooding, and hopefully that's down to the fact that with an Eastbourne Park, the council a number of years ago had the wisdom of building 
the, the uh, balancing lakes which have served us so well. As we've seen other parts of Sussex um, come under flood, uh, Lewis, Upfield and other areas of, of Sussex, Eastbourne's always survived. But we are at risk of the, 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 the tidal flooding and it's important that the Environment Agency do the, the work there. They, they've done a lot of, they've come up with a lot of uh, thoughts and they'll be presenting those to uh, the council and to the people of Eastbourne uh, and then we can, we can talk to them about just exactly what they're going to do. The time, the timing? Uh, I, I, I say within the next year, they, they, they've, come up, they've done their consultation, they're looking at a whole series of options at the moment, they've discounted some. They sh shared some early thoughts with us and uh, uh, around what they might be doing down at the eastern end of the seafront, which would, might have impacted on the Fort Fun and Princess Park areas. They've discounted those in their own thinking, but they haven't presented to us what the plans are. I, within the next 12 months, I believe, we'll have those. Um, the levelling up fund. Um, again, we spoke about this a year ago, and that is what we asked for. We were allowed under the levelling up fund bid number one to bid for a maximum of £20 million. We didn't like to be greedy. We asked for £19,847,287 <laughs> and I'm delighted to say that the government agreed to that. It's focused on three core interventions. One at Victoria Place and the nighttime economy and pedestrianisation there. One at Black Robin Farm, the, the new cultural and educational visitor centre and workspace, and one which is tied in with Towner and Towner's centenary, which is 2023. And I'm sure it won't have escaped your attention that 2023 not only is the Towner's centenary, but it's the year that they've got the Turner Prize here. So a really exciting year for Towner, and that, that will bring so much attention to Eastbourne and to the arts and culture within the town. Um, so I'm going to run, run through those three. One of the things I didn't say at the start of the meeting is that uh, unusually for one of these talks, I, I've been joined by two of my cabinet colleagues in Eastbourne. Uh, gentlemen, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> uh, I've got Councillor Colin Swansborough. Colin is uh, responsible on cabinet for the environment. And I've got Steve Holt, who is the money man at uh, Eastbourne and uh, saw us through the. Uh, you can sit down again now, it's all right, fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just getting to like this. <laughs> um, Steve was on uh, the bid, we were responsible for the wonderful uh, dressing of the town with the, all of the flowers, the floral displays, and the, uh, the, the, the flags for the Platinum Jubilee. And they also were responsible for the, the, the pop up. Um, uh, enterprise that took place during the summer when uh, uh, Victoria Place was, clo was closed. And of course, Victoria Place now will be fully pedestrianised. So that, that's a, a wonderful, I think, a very, very good enhancement. The council, as you know, were bought the shops and the flats there. The shops, uh, the, all the work on the shops are finished. And we've got some really good new local traders in there. So, so uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with what's happened there. Now the next slides I've stolen from Joe Hill because I didn't want to reinvent wheels and Joe at Towner has done some put some really good slides together around Black Robin. So this was the uh, telling you us about the levelling up fund and the fact that we secured the finance and the link of course is between Towner and Black Robin. So. Why Black Robin and what has that got to do with arts and culture? Well, the plans for Black Robin Farm, and I don't know if you've been up to see it. I know, Chris, you went up to see that, that with Colin earlier this week, and, or at the end of last week. And Black, the, the views, for those of you that, ha that know it, are stunning up there, they, they, especially if you get a, a decent day. Pro probably not one that we've got uh, today, but... Uh, on a dry, sunny day, uh, that, that's just the place you want to be. Uh, the arts and culture and education for all, teaching and learning in nature, and artist studios and maker space. So really providing an opportunity for people, perhaps who are not academically qualified, but have got real, really strong creative skills. And this, this is what the site looks like. It's 
Um, it may be difficult to see at the back, so I'll, I'll try and explain that to you a little bit. But uh, you've, you've got a gallery at the top left-hand corner there. You've got uh, the main farm yard next to that. And you've got coming down, I can't read, uh, I'm afraid, the, the, the faint print on there. But you've got education facilities and learning facilities, a kitchen garden, uh, and an opportunity to build new facilities for, for artists. So that, that's the plan for Black Robin. And the plan is that, the, that that will link and provide a cultural trail from the farm and from Beachy Head all the way down into the town centre and link up with Victoria Place and the, the levelling up monies that are being spent there. So summary of the proposals, and I'll read that because I can imagine that at the back of the room it's a little bit difficult to see that. Uh, summary of the proposals to deliver a learning and education centre for the arts and the environment and heritage, to support learning, uh, to support child learners and school visits, to support adult learners, to provide artist studios and maker spaces, facilities for walkers and cyclists, catering and events facilities, much needed creative industry workspace, including a specialist sculptural centre, and create a world-class cultural and heritage destination. And then on the right, uh, there was details of who Towner were consulting on that, which include schools, uh, people, uh, the accessibility groups, transport, uh, to make sure that walking groups, transport partners and cycling groups and ramblers all have a say, and the wider community and residents, uh, obviously, of the town, uh, as well as uh, such groups as probably the Eastbourne Astronomical Society and the Night Sky Watchers. Black Robin Farm. Black Robin so Robin. if you, you, you know the road that takes you up, the windy road at Beachy Head, that, that comes out and if you were to, you turn left and if you were to carry straight on, you'd be going on the road toward the coast road to Brighton. But if you turn left, you would go up towards the Beachy Head Countryside Centre yes. and the, 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 the hotel. Well, as you turn left there on the right hand side is the entrance to Black Robin Farm. Please go take a, 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 a trip up there, have a look at it. it the, the views really are spectacular. Uh, I took the, um, the, the, the lady who is an architect and who chairs uh, the Coastal Communities Group for the Southeast uh, Enterprise Partnership up there and she was blown away with what she saw. I, I took her up there in the summer. Um, moving on again, the Queen's Green Canopy. <coughs> For those of you that know Lord Rafe Lucas, this is uh, Rafe's project and it's a, a really exciting project. Yeah, what it will provide now, um, sadly following sad death of uh, our late monarch, is a lasting memory to the Queen. And it's uh, a, a plan to plant throughout the escarpment around the Downs. And uh, if you want more information of that, if you uh, search on uh, line the Queen's Green Canopy in Eastbourne, there's an opportunity to buy trees or shrubs to contribute towards that. Uh, I believe that trees are £100, shrubs uh, or bushes are £10, and that reminds me that I promised Rafe that I'd make a, a contribution to that, so a uh, note to myself to do that tomorrow morning. <coughs> and sticking with Rafe Lucas for a moment, Rafe was responsible for introducing Tim Smith to Eastbourne. He was a friend of his and he brought him down to Eastbourne. Um, and I'm delighted to say that Tim fell in love with the town, um, uh, as did David Harland, who is the chief executive down at Eden at the moment. And they've come down to Eastbourne many times and I've walked across the South Downs with them and I've walked from the golf club up to Beachy Head and I've taken them down to Shinewater Lake and into Eastbourne Park. And they, I, I, the, the amount, I can't describe the enthusiasm that they show for Eastbourne, that it's infectious and they look at the possibilities around biodiversity 
uh, look at the environment of which they see as a unique environment and they want East Eden to be associated with Eastbourne. So last year, um, together with East Sussex County Council, so it's a partnership between, between the two councils, Eastbourne and East Sussex, uh, we commissioned a piece of work. And uh, what we asked them to do was to look at four sites within a feasibility study. One of those is uh, on the seafront, and it's the eastern end of the seafront, so we're looking at uh, Fisherman's Green down to Fort Fun. Uh, one is uh, at the levels, as they call it. I've always called it Eastbourne Park, um, but it's the land at the centre of the town. I'll, I'll show you another picture of that in a moment. And two of them are connected with Beachy Head. One is the uh, looking at it from a tourist and a, a perspective and an opportunity to enhance and improve links between the town and the downs. And the study there is focusing on uh, the old former radar bunker. And one is the, uh, the public asset, which is Eastbourne Downs, and the opportunity to have links with the town. It's coming back to the Black Robin project that we already have underway with the levelling up fund. So those are the four locations, two on the downs, the levels or Eastbourne Park as I call them, and the eastern end of the seafront. And what they've come up with, uh, they, they've carried out that feasibility study and they've just reported back to us. So this is the first time I think that this information has gone into the public domain. There the, will the, be a full report and we'll, we'll be able to share that publicly in the near future. But they're saying, and, and I, I, forgive me, for, I don't normally read what's on slides, but I, I accept that this is a very large room and people at the back, if they've got the same sort of eyesight as me, are going to struggle. It says the seafront sites are situated along the seafront promenade and Royal Parade between Eastbourne Town Centre and Sovereign Harbour. The sites are visible all the way from east, the Eastbourne <coughs> Pier, allowing uh, to... Uh, to a constant visual connection between the town centre promenade and sites. With most of the tourist attractions being at the west of the pier, the seafront sites are mostly used by locals. Fort Fun attracted good numbers of visitors when it was open. Currently the promenade is mainly used on the west of the pier and up to Treasure Island and west of the pier. Most visitors arrive at uh, the sites by car, making use of the numerous pay and display car parks next to the sites. They can also use the Dotto train, which follows the coastline and stops at the most important locations to walk the seafront promenade, which takes approximately 40 minutes by foot. Um, so then they go on to look at those sites in more detail. What they've got from their analysis is obviously the the ownership of the site and the, the, the seafront sites are owned by the Borough Council, the connectivity to that by road, by foot and by dotto train, <coughs> and the, the current use of the sites. So they're looking at, on the seafront at Fort Fun, uh, Fisherman's Green and Prince's Park. And then on the levels, uh, they're looking there at the, they're saying, explaining that the levels consist of managed wetlands, marshy gra marshy grassland, gra sorry, marshy, marshy grassland, <laughs> put the teeth back in, uh, pastures, trees, lakes, waterways, and a great uh, value of natural, uh, nature and biodiversity. And then it talks about the site being at the centre of the town, mostly surrounded by residential areas, and accessibility being uh, across uh, connections across, particularly between east and west, in, and there's a need uh, to improve to overcome the road and rail barriers that unlock the full potential for that natural resource. So those are the areas, and you'll, you'll see, just to sort of put it in, in geographically in your minds, that's Lockbridge Drove. Uh, the ownership of that is between the Borough Council, East Sussex County Council and the Chatsworth Estate. So they've been talking with the Borough, the County and with Chatsworth. <coughs> and at Beachy Head, 
the, the, the ownership there is pr some privately owned and some owned by the council. Obviously connectivities, road, tourist bus and foot and cyclist. And they're looking at that uh, located at the west of Eastbourne and the eastern fringe of the, southern, uh, the South Downs National Park. So they, they've picked up obviously on the importance of the South Downs National Park, the opportunities that are provided so what, what are they looking at? They're looking at enhancing the biodiversity offering in the town and to make people more aware of that. They're, they're looking at the opportunity of doing something at the bunker potentially, uh, but not above ground, below ground. They're, they're looking at uh, what they call ancient grains. So uh, going back to the, the, the sort of uh, grains, the sort of harvest that we used to have many, many years ago, and recreating some of those and preserving them. And they're looking on the seafront uh, at linking the sea and the ecology of the sea uh, with a, a resource and what they call a dirty hands area for youngsters. So something along this, more along the eastern end of the seafront, uh, which is perhaps more uh, connected with what, what people expect from Eden, where youngsters can actually get in and get themselves messy and learn about uh, the ecology and the biodiversity of, of, the, of the land that they live in. So the, the, the proposals are exciting, I believe. Um, the, this is really very much hot off the press. They, they made a presentation to the council just a couple of weeks back. Uh, the, the next stages of this, uh, because this is a joint project between the Borough Council and the County Council, so we need to sit down with East, our partners in East Sussex County Council we need to look and decide whether to, uh, together we have an appetite for taking this to the next stage, which would be developing plans and looking at business cases, because obviously this needs to stack up financially, and then to share it with the town and see if the town has an, uh, shares that appetite and that interest in doing something new and different, uh, which uh, really would focus uh, attention on us, uh, on our town as a tourist area, but a tourist area linked to uh, what is currently probably the, the biggest problem that our, our planet faces, which is climate uh, change and the ways that that can be addressed through the natural resources we've got in a town such as Eastbourne. So I, I see this as very exciting. I look forward to being able to share once that they, they've given us the sort of full report and we've had a chance to talk with East Sussex and see whether or not we want to take this to an, the next level to share that more widely amongst the people of the town and to get your reaction. Uh, I know that uh, uh, one of the reasons I come, I love coming to speak to the Eastbourne Society is I know how much knowledge there is in this room. I know how much uh, knowledge there is of our local history and I know that you will give me honest feedback on what you feel. The final part of my, my talk is about local plan. Local plan is a, a statutory obligation for every town, every council, and it addresses uh, everything that we need to take into account for many years to come in terms of land allocation. So business land, uh, tourist and uh, activity land, and land for entertainment, but also land for residential development. And the government have some targets for us and their targets, uh, I think, are bonkers. Uh, that's the description that I have, because they say we need to build 728 houses a year. Um, now, that's not a party political statement locally. I know Robert's at the back of the room, and I think Robert's uh, comment was that it's absurd. Um, so we're joined up locally in our, uh, our fight against the government saying this is what you have to do. Uh, just to put it into context, the number of new homes that were developed between 2019 and 2022 in Eastbourne was 557. We're not opposed to the idea of building on, green, uh, on uh, uh, brownfield sites. Uh, we know that we need affordable homes, particularly for our local young people who are trying to get their first step on the housing ladder. Um, I, I'm critical of some developers who have got planning permission and haven't built and so they're land banking. And uh, I know that there are other sites that can be developed for social housing, for affordable housing. So uh, 
pro uh, affordable, obviously, a relative term. Uh, average house prices, I think, at the moment are at something like 292,000. Um, but what I don't want to see and what I want to ensure that we protect are the green, la the green field sites that we've got and particularly the land that, going back to what we were saying before, was um, the, the, the land that protects us against flooding. So here are the sites, this, this gives you an idea of the numbers that are in the plan. The plans have been drawn up by council officers. Uh, they've been drawn up by council officers because they have a responsibility to do that. But that doesn't mean that the council uh, or the councillors on either side of the, <coughs> the political divide in Eastbourne support the plans. So you, the, this takes you through the districts and you'll see that just about every district in the town, Seaside, St Anthony's, Sovereign Harbour, Langmey, Shinewater, Roselands, Bridgemere, Hamden Park, Ratton, Willingdon, Rip Willingdon Village, Oxlinge and Rodmill, Old Town, Upperton, Summerdown, the Saffrons, Meads and the Town Centre all have residential development within this plan. And that's the enlarged plan of the sites that we're looking at. I personally believe that a lot of those sites are extremely sensitive and I don't think that they're right for development. Um, so what happens next, and I'll, I'll just pick out a few of these sites, because I, I, I know I can see some of you straining to, to actually read some of those. Um, you've got, uh, on the eastern side, uh, you've got woods cottages, you've got land at east of Langley Levels, and you've got land on the Pevensey Bay Road. So as you're driving out past Asda, so you've got here, this is the Pevensey Bay Road, so you've got Asda, about there, and you've got the Pevensey's Levels. You'll be familiar probably with that land, which is low-lying farmland. Just behind there, you've got land along here, which is on uh, Priory Road. Uh, that's next to the Borough Football Club. You've got land here, which is in Sovereign Harbour. And we promised, as a council, the residents of Sovereign Harbour, that when, we, when the Sovereign Harbour plans were put together, there'll be no more than 160 new residences, and those are being built now. So th these are sites which weren't part of that. You've got land here on St Anthony's Hill. So if you know the Langney roundabout that takes you to Langney Rise one way and Pevensey Bay the, the other side, that's that triangle at the bottom of Rotunda Road. You've got land uh, that is by Finmere Road, and that's uh, the, um, the gas works at the moment. So I'm not saying all of these sites are wrong. There's land in Cortlands Road. There's land on the seafront at Fisherman's Green. There's land at Moy Avenue. The Dairy Crest site you might be familiar with, that's already been knocked down in Waterworks Road. You've got in the town centre, the Junction Road multi-storey car park. Uh, you've got uh, the former uh, sites within Langney Road, that's Bonner's Music Centre, um, other town centre sites, and then coming over to the west of the town, you've got uh, sites um, around Meads area, and so what you've got around the Meads area, of course, are the university sites. <coughs> um, now, I, I, I think as I say, personally, I think that um, a few of those sites are appropriate, but many of them are not. And so the next steps are this uh, plan goes out for public consultation. I urge you to look at those plans. They'll be available from the 18th of November, and you get the opportunity to uh, give, put, give your views on those through till January. And I'd be really grateful if you would take the trouble to look at them and to, to feed back on what your thoughts are. Uh, the next step beyond that, uh, because this is, this is the identification of sites, uh, the officers will compile a report, bringing all those views together. And then from that, the Borough Council will have a responsibility, <coughs> excuse me, have a responsibility for reporting to government on what its local plan will be and consulting on, again on that, that plan of what they want to do. So this is a long process. 
It doesn't end until 2024, but this is the first step of it, and this is the opportunity for you to explain what your views are uh, to the council, and they will all be read, all looked at, and a report on those compiled. Um, so these plans will all be on the council's website. You can get you can get a printed copy if you want in one uh, of the plans. You can read through them. You can respond to the consultation. So it starts on the 18th of November. It runs through to January. So there's plenty of time to to read through them. And I'd really appreciate you doing so and feeding back your views on those. No, uh, you're absolutely right, and you did mention it a year ago. Just in case everybody didn't hear, it was about the, the accessibility to the uh, Congress Theatre and for disabled parking. Uh, at the moment, it's the very limited spaces, but they're around the back, and uh, it was a question of whether we could provide something at the front in terms of a drop-off. I did look at that. It's not as easy as it might appear, in the sense that it would need a whole. Uh, it would need the. Uh, involvement of new traffic regulations to do that, but I haven't forgotten it, and we w I do want to see something improved there. It, it, it is in terms of getting from the vehicle to the theatre itself. Once you're inside, of course, with the new lifts and the accessibility That's right the way through, it's all very good. But, you, but no, you, 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 you are absolutely right, and I'm not trying to shirk, shirk the issue. It is uh, one of the getting the, the traffic orders and getting things changed and the expense of doing so, but I haven't forgotten it. Uh, and I did speak to officers about it after the meeting we had last year. And, I, and I, will, I, will, I will continue to pursue it, I assure you. A supplement. I'm oh, sorry. It, sorry, it's just you've mentioned the winter gardens. Mm. Do you have a time scale for that? Uh, we hope to have that uh, completed by the end of next year. Oh, yes, the, the, but I say it's a question of costings. It's a question of what we can do there. But it's that final piece of the jigsaw, and I desperately want to see it put in place. Robin. Okay. Yeah, um, I understand, and that I think is going to be done um, because uh, it, it was one of those things w with the best will in the world. When people design things, they think they've got it right, and then you look at it, and there's the, that desire path and the bush, the shrubs have been worked, uh, have been sort of eroded more than once. And I, was, I spoke to Rob Cottrell about it, and he said, "Yes, they're looking at putting something in there." Okay. The, the plan, uh, sorry, the lady was asking, uh, pointing out the local papers stating that the town's being told to build 738 houses per year, but not saying what the duration of that is. That, that's a, taking us through a 25-year plan. <laughs> the, the question there was regarding the uh, uh, land uh, on Brighton University campus and uh, whether I was able to tell you anything about the withdrawal of the university. I was very disappointed with the university's decision to withdraw from Eastbourne, particularly as when they withdrew from Hastings, I met with them and asked the direct question of whether they were planning to withdraw from Eastbourne and they assured me that they weren't. They said that uh, they might well be looking to further develop in Eastbourne, but they couldn't say that publicly because it would offend Hastings. That was when they moved from Hastings. As we know, they then, without any consultation, decided that they were going to withdraw from Eastbourne. I, I held a, a meeting, it was still in the days of uh, the pandemic, so we, we had a Zoom meeting, uh, Caroline Ansel, MP and myself, uh, both uh, on, on met Brighton University online. We put our concerns uh, the, of the impact of that withdrawal from the town and asked them to reconsider. Uh, they refused to do so, and they're determined to be moving out and they're looking to move out next year. Um, that raises the question of what happens to their buildings. Their halls of residence are not owned by the university. Uh, we established from the questions we asked them, they will actually cost them money to move out 
of the halls of residence because they're on long-term lease. Uh, the buildings that they own themselves, which of course the educational buildings and the, uh, the, the sporting facilities that they've got, uh, they are looking to sell. Uh, what have I been doing and what have the council been doing and others been doing? We've been approaching other educational establishments in the hope of bringing somebody else here. I think that Brighton University have got the idea that because uh, uh, there's nobody between them and Kent University in Canterbury, they've got a very large catchment area. Um, I, I would love to prove them wrong, but uh, they're not being very helpful in terms of making their buildings available uh, to other interested educational parties. But we're working very hard to address that. And so I still live with the hope that we'll be able to attract another educational provider here. But we need to be ready to deal with the consequences if we can't. And the question regarding the bandstand takes me back to the levelling up fund. You will remember that we talked about the levelling up fund being 19 million, almost 20 million, 19.8 million. Uh, that we asked for out of the 20. And um, we're now being a bit like Oliver Twist because the government have announced a uh, levelling up fund two. And so we have put a bid in against levelling up fund two for £27 million. The amount is different. And that would, if we're granted it, deal with the full restoration of the bandstand and the redoubt, including the colonnades. That's what that £27 million. We're waiting to hear. We've put in a bid against that. And so uh, we're, we're hopeful that the government will say, yes, we will we'll, we'll go, give, grant you this money in the same way as they did in the first round. In the meantime, this year, we've got £750,000 uh, in this year's budget to be spent by the next, uh, the end of March next year. And that is dealing with the guttering on, and the roof. It's dealing with the doors, the sliding doors, so you can lock them on the stage and the tracking for those. And it's restoring the, the stage at the, the bandstand. And so the bandstand will be open again by Easter next year. And we're booking uh, performers to come into that. The, the question there was around whether there was any money for Hampden Park. Uh, for uh, in improving the, the safety in particular around the, 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 the lake and the park area. There's not in this year's uh, budget, but we'll take that away and we'll put it, uh, look, look to uh, the capital programme for next year. So thank you. What are the future plans for the uh, ex-tourist information office in the town centre, please? Uh, it's going to be, it's, it's been leased to uh, a private individual uh, who is going to start a business there in the very near future. May we know the type of business? Um, I don't know how much is co commercially sensitive, um, but it, the, the, the person is Chris Copping, who owns West Rocks Hotel. I, I don't think that's a, a secret. And he, he's got a number of establishments in Eastbourne, uh, in the Meads area as well, and they're all of very high quality. Thank you. Uh, Black Robin Farm, um, you said in the summary of proposals that there's an education centre uh, for arts, environment and heritage. Um, who or what local heritage groups were, were ever consulted on that? Uh, and what part of heritage is going to be played out up there? Right, uh, thanks Russell. Um, as to who was consulted, I haven't got that, that, that information at my fingertips. I can find it out for you and I will. Um, but it, it, I would want your society to be involved in that going forward. And so if you speak to me over that drink you promised me, I will make sure that happens. And thank you, David, for your talk. Um, you mentioned the levels as being managed wetlands. Um, could you, or one of your councillors, um, just indicate who manages the wetlands and uh, is there a management of the foreshore, um, which I understand is also a site of special scientific interest? Right. Um, the, the foreshore is the responsibility of the Environment Agency to answer that question. Um, the wetlands, <coughs> the management there is uh, under different uh, organisations depending on the land ownership. Um, part of it 
which the council had a, 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 has the ownership of, we've leased to, and this is, if you can think along Seven Oaks Road, if you know Seven Oaks, um, it's the land along there has been leased to West Drive School and they use it for educational purposes. They've done some rather clever things like uh, build coracles that uh, they've taken the children out in. For a while they uh, had water buffalo that were grazing there, three generations of water buffalo. Um, and they, they look after and manage the, 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 the site. But some, uh, it's a bit of a patchwork quilt of ownership and so the, ma the individual management of those wetlands uh, resides with the individual owner of the land. You've got Chatsworth Estate owning some of it, a bit owned by Borough Council, a bit by uh, East Sussex County Council, and some others owned by individual, uh, uh, probably farmers or former farmers. I want to go back to the placing of the Tourist Information Centre. Many, many years ago, the Tourist Information Centre had a presence in the railway station. Then it went into Cornfield Road, Cornfield Road has served extremely well for a lot of years, whereas the Markham Centre doesn't fully live up to its name. We should be a town that welcomes everybody the minute they walk into the town. And I think getting a presence back in the station is important. But I think what is really sad is that the building that was the ticket office that over recent months has opened as yet another coffee shop, endangering Bellas and putting it out of business, why the hell didn't someone jump on that as the most important welcoming aspect of visitors to his world? Uh, to, to try and answer your question, I mean, it, it is down to cost at the end of the day and what the council taxpayers can afford. Uh, I remember before the, there was a presence in the station, uh, the tourist information centre as such was along the seafront. And it was when it was moved into the town centre, uh, the council got a lot of complaints and said, why on earth have you moved it from the, the seafront into the uh, town centre? Because the majority of uh, the visitors who need the information come and uh, their, their natural port of call is the seafront. <coughs> Um, and so there was a lot of criticism at that time. Um, we can't afford, unfortunately, the, 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 the two centres, the, the Welcome Centre and the, the former TIC. What we've done is managed to save the money by combining the work of the TIC with that of the ticketing. I understand what you say. It is, I'm afraid, down to money. Uh, if only we could afford to do more. Uh, I understand what the, the lady was saying, that we wish the council would look again and say we're a holiday town and we want to make our visitors really, really welcome. And I understand that entirely. The, the, the challenge is for all holiday towns, and many have actually closed their tourist information centres completely. Um, there's been a survey of that in Eastbourne, seen as one of the, the, the ones that actually is at the forefront of providing access and information for tourists. Um, it comes down to local government funding and uh, consecutive governments have taken money away from local government and they continue to do so. Back in 2010, uh, we received something called the Revenue Support Grant and the government gave us £10 million a year and that was to help provide local services. We get zero now. That, that's how much the money has been taken away. It affects all councils, it's not East, just Eastbourne. Uh, I meet with leaders uh, on different political parties from across the UK. Uh, uh, many councils are really struggling, some are, are close to bankruptcy. And uh, our, our county council also has many, many challenges. They've got a £17 million gap in, in their finances going forward and they've got the pressures of increased uh, need for adult social care and children's services. Uh, that We need government to understand that services that people care about, the sort of services that you mentioned, that others in the room have mentioned, are, are, are something that people value and that they need to be paid for and that just constantly taking money out of local government. Uh, if, if it hadn't been for local councils, we wouldn't have got through the pandemic in the way that we did. And uh, I know our own staff at Eastbourne, uh, people who were accountants, people 
who were, de were dealing with uh, phone calls and other things normally, uh, that they were suddenly packing bags and taking grab bags out to people who were vulnerable and people in need. Uh, local government makes a big difference to our community and that's why I stood as a local councillor and I'll fight passionately for local, uh, get local government until my dying day. And really, just to say, I don't think this, the town's very clean. I mean, I, you know, when I came those flower beds and where the new trees have been planted between the same locations, so much litter in, in them as metal grills and hundreds of cigarette ends. And this is the same in um, Cornfield Road and the bottom end of South Street and Hardwick and, and I just think it's... And I volunteered last time, I volunteered at the Heritage Centre and the number of people who say to me how shabby the town looks. And I don't agree with them. I, I really do try and build the town up. I do not agree with them all the time. Just, just an observation really. That I think they look, they look a bit shabby, the fire does, I don't know. Uh, th thank you for what you do in terms of a litter pick. I also do litter picks fairly regularly. I have, you know, the gloves, the grabber, and the, 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 the sacks. Um, I don't understand the mentality of the people who throw litter all around. I never have. I mean, litter doesn't just suddenly appear. It is down to people just indiscriminately throwing away things and leaving somebody else to tidy it up. The town centre is actually uh, cleaned and swept every day so it, it's the, the volume of the, the, the people going through there and the amount that they throw away. With regard to the flower beds, yes, I remember your question. It's the, the flower beds were provided by East Sussex County Council and uh, it wasn't we were transferring them, looking for the county to transfer them to the borough council. Uh, we were looking at uh, them being transferred to the Eastbourne bid. And uh, Steve, as I say, um, is the chief exec of the bid, so he may be able to update us on how that, that uh, transfer is progressing. Uh, it's slightly different to what David's just explained, so apologies David, but to give no, you no. a bit of background, because as part of my work, I've lobbied the East Sussex, and to be fair, East Small Borough Council, really hard with regards to those planters. Um, what was meant to happen is after the uh, planters were installed, they were meant to be handed over to the East Small Borough Council for maintenance uh, by Mildred's and then by East Sussex County Council, who did the the roadworks. For whatever reason, that didn't happen and, and sort, of, sort of should have happened during the COVID period and it didn't happen. Um, eventually, when we lobbied as part of the bid, we were able to get East Sussex County Council to agree that they should have had it over but never did and never formally did. And that's when East Bourne Borough, they then sent that to East Bourne Borough Council, officially handed them over with funding to improve those planted areas, which is why during uh, sort of early March, they will all be planted and all be done. I think what's happened now is that we've come to the end of the summer and spring season and some of them are leaning to be probably a little bit more tended after and a little bit looked after and we've reported that and the council have been really good on that. What's really good as well is that the plans are also to do those, they kind of stopped uh, outside the entrance of the beacon and actually it should be extended past the beacon uh, to up the upper end of Cornfield Road where there's a bit more bits and pieces that need doing. So very shortly you should see some uh, improvements with regards to those planting schemes um, and, and planting areas. Meanwhile, as the bid you may have seen, we, as David said, with regards to the planters, we installed a load of railing planters all along on the major roads and the major access and they're still in bloom and still looking lovely and tended for and all being well providing East Sussex County Council don't evict me. Uh, they should be in place uh, for the spring next year as well with a new colour scheme. So I hope you've been enjoying those. So, um, and also, on, a, on another note, in terms of professionally, my team, uh, we employ um, some street wardens and street ambassadors. They go around regularly litter picking and working with partners to litter pick. Um, one of the side challenges we've had is we've had a number of fast food uh, restaurants uh, open recently, which is great because they employ staff and, and they're a welcome addition to the town centre, don't get me wrong, but it does attract additional listeners, so we're working very closely with them to see if we can get some more litter bins installed and for their staff to actively, proactively uh, litter pick as well as is part of their conditions. So very shortly you should see an improvement. Thank, thanks Steve, I, I knew you'd know the answer. Uh... Could I just ask, um, why were the bins and the benches removed from the area on Terminus Road from Marks and Spencers to going, going up towards Victoria Place? 
There's nowhere to sit and nowhere to put rubbish. Right. Uh, and that, it's a county council responsibility rather than a borough responsibility. And so I'm guessing a bit here, but I'm guessing that it's linked to the next phase of the town centre redevelopment. That, that phase is about to start and they're developing, that, that's taking people from, the, the development from, on from where it, uh, the, the first phase ended at Bankers Corner, from Bankers Corner through uh, up to Bolton Road. Bolton Road and Langley Road and beyond. So I know that, that that's underway and it may be as part of that process. But if, if you want to give me your details at the end, I'll get, I'll get that confirmed and ask a question of the county. And I'll also let Chris know so he can put it out in the newsletter to the society. I, I'll, I'll deal with them all. Uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll deal with them all. Uh, the, the first one is, yes, it does sound a very simple solution, doesn't it? Get some maps up. It has to be done in conjunction with the County Council, of course, the highway land that it would go on is theirs. And we have been talking about to them about uh, a, a proper sign posting and maps can be included as part of that. So we'll pursue that. Uh, the graffiti, um, I, God forbid that we ever become like Brighton. I went over to Brighton recently. I try to avoid it as much as possible. And there's graffiti everywhere, everywhere. I mean, it's, uh, if people know Bristol, it's becoming like Bristol. Um, and we're not anything like that. Uh, we have a hit squad that go around and deal with graffiti if it's reported. Uh, we get monthly reports on how much graffiti, uh, how many reports of graffiti there have been. It's been on the increase. Um, with the statutory bodies, they clear their own and the, uh, the, the cabinets. Uh, so if you look at City Fibre and Lightning Fibre, they're actually very good at clear, cleaning them. Um, and, and we've got officers who go around and clear it from our own sites. On private property, of course, it's the responsibility of the owner of the property, but we pursue them. Uh, I report graffiti myself. Whenever I see it, I, I, I photograph it and I send it through, and it's generally cleared within a couple of days. There's nothing better than, uh, than clearing something off before the graffiti artist has managed to take his friends or her friends round to see their, their, their handiwork. So um, we will do our very best to keep on top of it. The, the, the juicy one, as you call it, is of concern to us as a, a council, a cross-party. Um, we've lobbied government. I know that Caroline Ansell has also been speaking to Robert Jenrick over the weekend. East Sussex County Council have lobbied government. The home, this is the Home Office. Um, they put uh, asylum seekers into Eastbourne hotels without any consultation whatsoever. They told us they had done it. They didn't t ask us, they didn't say we're planning to do it. They told us they had done it. And we're seek going to be seeking an injunction to stop that. Um, three count I I've been watching the local press recent, uh, not sorry, the national press recently. Four councils have already taken out injunctions against the, the, that pl those sort of placements. Three of them were successful, one of them was unsuccessful, and this is over the last week. Um, I, I don't think that the Home Office has got a clear strategy. Uh, I think that it's just putting people into places in, totally indiscriminately without any consultation with the local residents, without the, any consultation with the local authorities. And I think that we need to, to do our very best collectively, and I, I, when I say collectively in that sense, I mean local government, to, to, to get them to address that and to come up with a, a proper plan. That, I mean, they, they talk about dispersal. We're not seeing dispersal because there are 300 odd councils in the country and all that I see is them being concentrated in the southeast of England. I'll, I'll deal with those in reverse order. I'll look, at the, look into the flower beds in Devonshire Place. Um, generally, uh, this time of year, the, 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 there are, the flowers have all disappeared anyway, but we'll try and get, make sure that they're reinvigorated for next season in the same way as we do with the carpet gardens and other areas. So I'll take that one away and I'll, as Steve I'm looking at, he'll make a note for me because um, I, I, I can't write and talk at the same time. Um, but I, I will take that away. Uh, with what do the asylum seekers do during the day? I actually feel very sorry for them in the sense that I don't think they do very much. 
Um, what the government have done, what the Home Office have done in terms of support is simply from what I can gather, and they haven't spoken to me at all on this, but what I can gather, they provide security guards to make sure they stay in the hotels, um, but they don't provide any services. So what, what I believe they should be doing wherever they're placed is to provide the support services. So uh, the, the, it puts pressure not just on Eastbourne as a council, uh, and increases the cost of temporary accommodation for homeless people that we, we seek to house. But it puts pressure on the County Council, and I was speaking to the leader of the County Council this morning and the Chief Executive of the County Council about this this morning. Uh, it puts pressure on their adult social care services. It puts pressure on their children's services. Uh, in the health economy, it puts pressure on the NHS. And we know that already it's very, very difficult to get a GP appointment in Eastbourne or a dental appointment, but it puts pressure on those services. None of the, 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 the money that the government's spending here is providing that, that support. It's all being put on to the, 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 the local statutory authorities. And it is totally wrong. <laughs>